An American Tragedy. An American Tragedy is a 1925 novel by American writer Theodore Dreiser. He began the manuscript in the summer of 1920, but a year later abandoned most of that text. It was based on the notorious murder of Grace Brown in 1906 and the trial of her lover. In 1923 Dreiser returned to the project, and with the help of his wife Helen and two editor secretaries, Louise Campbell and Sally Cassell, he completed the massive novel in 1925. The book entered the public domain in the United States on January 1, 2021. Character Analysis Clyde Griffiths The protagonist victim in Dreiser's book wants to be like the American dream of success. He wants to be rich so that he can buy expensive clothes, be chauffeured around in nice cars, and eat at fancy restaurants. He wants to have sexy adventures. Both sexy and romantic. He trusts people who are adventurous and like to have fun. People who like to go to parties that are brightly lit and have a lot of music. In the end, he thinks that personal freedom and independence are very important, because they let him get away from things like pain and responsibility, as well as his family. When Clyde was a child, he saw that his family's strict reliance on prayer and precepts didn't work. Instead, it made things worse. His father, on the other hand, isn't as successful as his rich uncle. Clyde hates how poor and ignorant his family is, how they can't help him or give him the things he wants. He doesn't like how his parents did their religious work in dingy mission houses and on the streets of cities. Their lack of roots has caused him to have an irregular education and to always feel like an outsider. Clyde, who is alone, daydreams about becoming a successful person, even though he can't because he lives in a dirty place and has a strong sense of emotions and exotic romance from his father. Outside of the mission world, when he sees clothes, girls, and homes that are lit up, his reaction is strong. He projects his jealousy, lust, and sadness into them. Though he wants to have fun, he thinks about how it could be bad for him. But because he is naturally weak, he knows that powerful forces both inside and outside of him can overwhelm him for good or bad. When he is overcome by temptation, he instinctively thinks of ways to make sense of it. His reward is a renewed sense of his own glory and worth. During Clyde's rise from poor middle class to rich, his morality is weak and sometimes even cruel. Clyde Griffiths looks good from the start, but he is nervous and refined. As a bellhop, he learns how to get along with people from all walks of life and how to deal with the social cannibalism that is all around him, too. Even though he appears to be respectful, he stays away from people who are both below and equal to him in rank. In evasions and outright lies, he hides his poor background, secret indulgences, and questionable behavior from the world around him. His mental and moral cowardice turns into mental and accidental murder because of his instinct to run away from obligations and mishaps. To find God, he turns to his mother and Reverend Macmillan. Two people he never thought of as God. Macmillan is so patient and sincere that Clyde spills out his confession and feels like he can trust and believe in his own goodness. But there is no hope of a stay of execution for Clyde. So he starts to have doubts. Though Macmillan says he will be saved, number 77,221 senses very little as he walks to the electric chair. It is ironic that Russell, the nephew of Clyde Griffiths, looks just like him. Character Analysis Elvira Griffiths Clyde's mother believes in a God who is kind. Because of her faith and good works, she thinks she has been called to spread the word of God. This is what she says, in spite of all her efforts to save souls. She deeply cares for her children, knowing that they carry the flaws and sins of everyone else. When she looks shabby and lives in a small, dirty house, she thinks about how to be a good person, not how to look good and make money for herself. She is so filled with religious fervor that she can't understand how big Clyde's non-spiritual dreams are. After she fell in love with the visionary Asa Griffiths, her own dreams began to form. As a young farm girl, she didn't give much thought to religion because she didn't know much about it. 
but because she had been vaccinated against the virus of evangelism. She went on with her husband's religious adventures to fake green fields. Kansas City, Denver, and San Francisco were not Griffith's first cities. They had done missions or preached on the streets of Grand Rapids and Detroit, as well as Milwaukee, Quincy, and Chicago. Elvira, like her husband, doesn't know that their kids need to learn how to do things for a living or work in a job. In spite of her pain, this extreme Protestant is still hopeful. She prays for help with her family and work problems, and she thinks that will help. Elvira sees the physical world as the devil's playground, where evil delights tempt the innocent and the unwary. She gives up her own desires and sees the world as a playground for the devil. She thinks there will be a life after death that never ends. That isn't to say that when her maternal instincts start to kick in, she wants to protect her kids from shame and death. A good person would want to help Esther and Clyde get out of trouble, but her resources are stretched to the limit when Clyde needs help. This is especially true because she doubts his honesty. In order to save him, she puts herself out there in front of the public and gets ridiculed. Even though she doesn't save Clyde, she helps Esther. It was brave of her to adopt Esther's illegitimate child, but she now has to live with the pain of living a lie. Still believing in a good God, she prays for the salvation of Clyde's soul. In fact, her faith is stronger because she has been through so much. Elvira can see how the Green Davidson, the pleasure-seeking friends, fugitiveness, sexual temptation, and high society are having a big impact on her son. Who is very weak. She also realizes that she didn't do enough to help Clyde get ready for life in this world. She gives her grandson Russell a dime for ice cream because she wants him to be happy. Character Analysis Samuel Griffiths Uncle Clyde is owner of Griffiths Collar and Shirt Company in Lycurgus, New York. He is the American dream come true. When he thinks about his good name and family and wealth and possessions, he is very concerned about how they will be seen. He also thinks that working hard helps build character. Especially for people who are going to rise. The way he thinks and feels is similar to what Benjamin Franklin wrote about in the book he called Autobiography. He is a contrast to Clyde's father, who Samuel hasn't seen in 30 years. Clyde's uncle is a good person. The Mushy Acer got $1,000. Samuel and another son got $15,000, and Joseph Griffiths left his money to them. Samuel, who was chosen by God, put his money into the factory of Lycurgus. In time, his family became well known in the area, if not as one of the oldest, then as one of the most conservative, respectable, and successful. Lycurgus was a very well known place until Clyde came to town. Asa has been treated unfairly and Samuel Griffiths, who is very clever, wants to do something to help his polite nephew. As a family man, he is moved by how much his young blood relative and his own son look like each other. The economic necessitarian is cautious by nature. So he or she ends up with sentimental nepotism. But only in his logical framework of conditions and rules does he give in. So even though he's very good at business, he doesn't see it as quickly as his wife and youngest daughter do. Gilbert is very angry with his western cousin. As soon as Samuel Griffith's nephew is arrested and charged with murder. He is calm and judicious. He places a high moral value on the golden mean. He gives legal advice freely, but there are a lot of conditions and qualifications. These qualifications come from his vanity, family pride, and a sense of right and wrong. It's very important that he hires lawyers for Clyde only if they're honest and if Clyde isn't guilty. In good faith, he has invited Clyde to Lycurgus, given him a job, invited him to social events, and given him defense lawyers, but only up to a point. Samuel Griffiths does what he can to protect himself, his business, and his family after Clyde is found guilty of murder. The truth is, Something has happened now that has made him and his family look bad, and maybe he and his family did this as well. He and Gilbert decide to move the business to South Boston and move the family somewhere else. Because of the way things turned out. 
Samuel thinks Asa's treatment by their father was not unfair. Finally, he regretfully gives up Clyde and recommits himself to the rule that sentiment in business is a waste of time. Character Analysis Roberta Alden Clyde's girlfriend at work thinks that life and love are important. In the same way as Clyde, she wants a better life and a better chance at a good marriage. But she doesn't have any big dreams about marrying into money and luxury. She thinks that her efforts work and that it's important to keep going to school. It is important to her to be moral, but the power of Eros takes over her. Before she dies, she puts on a show of respectability. If you look at Roberta, you can see that she is the daughter of a poor farmer. Her family doesn't have enough money, so she has to work at a nearby factory. Even though her looks, charm, and morals are better than those in her rural community, the young men there think she's a factory type. She doesn't know very much about men or birth control. During her early years in the factory, she felt like an outsider, which made her shy. She likes not only Clyde's charm and position, but also how he looks. The way she responds to nature is both sensual and serene when she picks water lilies and when she puts her hand in the lake to look at it. Passionately in love with Clyde, she later feels guilty but keeps having sex with him. After Clyde says he'll marry her, she feels better. People don't talk to people from other countries at work. Roberta breaks a factory taboo by meeting with her supervisor. She not only meets Clyde in secret, but she also breaks her sexual rules. For Clyde's sake and not to shame her family, she wants an abortion and, if that doesn't work, she thinks about taking her own life. Behind her, there is a trail of evasion and deception that she has used to get away. In the last ditch effort to save herself and her family's good name, she threatens Clyde with a short-term marriage, knowing that he doesn't care about her at all. In the eyes of the district attorney, Roberta's dead body is the most important thing in the world. Burton Burley snatches a few hairs from her head to use to make Clyde look bad. Mason gives Clyde a long, light brown piece of his dead love's hair at the trial. This is what he says. Roberta's pathetic letters are used by newspaper men, pamphleteers, and the prosecuting attorney. It is also through Mason that the court hears her speak, as if from the dead. Character Analysis Sandra Finchley Those material things which cause Clyde to contemplate murder are taken for granted by his American dream girl. Typifying young, sophisticated wealth. Sandra Finchley is the glass of Lycurgus fashion. She is devoted to clothes and fun and games and romantic love. Society is her stage, and nature is her playground. She plays with the conventions around her but does not break them. Unlike Roberta Alden. Sandra Finchley is the daughter of a rich manufacturer. She is not only popular with her select social circle, but she is its pace setter. Her pursuits, swimming, boating, riding, driving, tennis, and golf, seem more like outdoor parties. And at parties it is her custom to shatter young men with her charms, Gilbert Griffiths accepted. In spite of the demands upon her attentions. She remains very much her own young lady, free of entangling alliances or compromises. But so supreme is Clyde's adulation of her that this seeking Aphrodite becomes infatuated with her worshipper. Cautious and doubtful, she is puzzled by the chemistry of mutual attraction. Dreiser's treatment of her Clyde Midi love patter and love letters is deeply satiric. Though intellectually shallow, Sondra is clever, her mind quick and inventive. At Twelfth Lake, she thinks what a great lark it would be to elope with Clyde, but her ingrained sense of the practical reconciles the best of both worlds until Clyde's arrest. In the beginning, Sandra's interest in Clyde is not real, only a device to irritate Gilbert Griffiths. Furthermore, if harm seems headed her way, she plans to drop Clyde quickly. To deceive both Gilbert and her parents. Sandra uses her friends as fronts to Clyde's entrance into her set. Once in, Clyde is the object of her pretended indifference, her teasing, and her flirting. Feeling herself drawn toward him, she nevertheless keeps him as behaved and leashed as her French bulldog, Bissell, by impressing him with luxuries. By handing him money on the sly, by warning him of her parents' disapproval, 
and by conjuring up a picture of matrimonial and executive bliss. Known only as Miss X during Clyde's trial, and still shielded by her father's influence and wealth, Sondra retreats to Narragansett. Having seen life's grimness for the first time in her young life, she broods on the loss of her girlhood innocence. She longs to repossess her letters to Clyde. Yet she writes Clyde one last note, typewritten, anonymous, and in the third person. When Clyde reads of her remembrance, suffering, bewilderment, sorrow, sympathy, and good wishes, the last trace of his golden dream vanishes. Character Analysis Orville W. Mason A short, broad-chested, and dynamic district attorney in Cattaraqui County is already well on his way to becoming an American dreamer. Clyde Griffiths was found guilty of murdering his wife and son. He fights for more political and legal power when he is on the brink of making money. He wants to win and be famous, so he thinks it's best to take the best chance. Mason knows that strong people often crush weak people, so he wants to be strong. This is why he wants to be strong. There's no doubt that he wants to win over people who had easier childhoods than him. His poverty and lack of attention as a child help him become more ambitious, just like Clyde did. Childish things were put away very early on by the son of a poor farmer. He took care of his mother, who had been left alone after her husband died. Reporting for newspapers began at the age of 17, and he started studying law in an old judge's office in Bridgeburg when he was 19. Afterwards, he worked in state politics for a few years. After that, he came back to Bridgeburg to work as assistant district attorney, auditor, and district attorney for two terms. It helps that Mason is married and has two kids. Mason thinks that Clyde's case is the answer to his political future. As a child, Mason had a skating accident that left him with a broken nose that looks sinister. Although Mason is a type of the Dreesarian Superman, he is also a lot of fun to be around. What the Freudians are used to calling a psychic sex scar. The reader should know that Mason's repressed sexuality, his sympathy for the dead Roberta, and his dislike of handsome, wealthy young men all have a lot to do with each other. Mason, who has a lot of heart and wants to be a politician, is shrewd, energetic, and bold when he fights for the dead girl who can't fight back or say no to her broken-nosed advocate. Mason, who is very good at talking and moving, wants to prosecute Clyde. But he does it for not so good reasons. His main goal isn't to find the truth or do the right thing, but to get elected as a judge. Even though he takes a stand for what he believes in. He has a lot of support from both honest and dishonest people. When Clyde is injured, the person who is hurt is Clyde. This is good for him, his friends, and his party. Mason's fighting instincts were sparked by the support of the community and the faltering defense. Mason is shown as a foxhound leaping at its prey. Mason is a bully, sarcastic, and sly person who uses oratorical displays to help him dominate a scene. Even before the trial is over, the people vote him into office. He keeps adding facts, witnesses, and physical evidence. Like a boat and two small hairs, as he goes on to show how math and real things work. In the end, Clyde's enemy. Roberta's avenging hero, walks out of court with his entourage, a conquering hero in the crowd of men who are cheering him on, like a king. Plot Summary Plot Clyde Griffiths is raised by poor and devoutly religious parents to help in their street missionary work. As a young man, Clyde must, to help support his family, take menial jobs as a soda jerk, then a bellhop at a prestigious Kansas City hotel. There, his more sophisticated colleagues introduce him to bouts of social drinking and sex with prostitutes. Enjoying his new lifestyle, Clyde becomes infatuated with manipulative Hortense Briggs, who manipulates him into buying her expensive gifts. When Clyde learns Hortense goes out with other men, he becomes jealous. Nevertheless, he would rather spend money on her than to help his sister, who had eloped only to end up pregnant and abandoned by her lover. Clyde's life changes dramatically when his friend Sparser, driving Clyde. Hortense, 
and other friends back from a secluded rendezvous in the country in his boss's car, used without permission, hits a little girl and kills her. Fleeing from the police at high speed, Sparser crashes the car. Everyone but Sparser and his partner flee the scene of the crime. Clyde leaves Kansas City, fearing prosecution as an accessory to Sparser's crimes. While working as a bellboy at an exclusive club in Chicago, he meets his wealthy uncle Samuel Griffiths, the owner of a shirt collar factory in the fictional city of Lycurgus, New York. Samuel, feeling guilt for neglecting his poor relations, offers Clyde a menial job at the factory. After that, he promotes Clyde to a minor supervisory role. Samuel Griffiths's son Gilbert, Clyde's immediate supervisor, warns Clyde that as a manager, he should not consort with women working under his supervision. At the same time the Griffiths's pay Clyde little attention socially. As Clyde has no close friends in Lycurgus, he becomes lonely. Emotionally vulnerable, Clyde is drawn to Roberta Alden. A poor and innocent farm girl working in his shop. Who falls in love with him. Clyde secretly courts Roberta, ultimately getting her pregnant. At the same time, elegant young socialite Sandra Finchley, daughter of another Lycurgus factory owner, takes an interest in Clyde despite his cousin Gilbert's efforts to keep them apart. Clyde's engaging manner makes him popular among the young smart set of Lycurgus, he and Sondra become close, and he courts her while neglecting Roberta. Roberta expects Clyde to marry her to avert the shame of an unwed pregnancy, but Clyde now dreams instead of marrying Sondra. Having failed to procure an abortion for Roberta, Clyde gives her no more than desultory help with living expenses while his relationship with Sondra matures. When Roberta threatens to reveal her relationship with Clyde unless he marries her, he plans to murder her by drowning while they go boating. He had read a local newspaper report of a boating accident. Clyde takes Roberta out in a canoe on the fictional Big Bitten Lake, modeled on Big Moose Lake New York, in the Adirondacks, and rows to a secluded bay. He freezes. Sensing something wrong, Roberta moves toward him, and he unintentionally strikes her in the face with a camera, stunning her and accidentally capsizing the boat. Roberta, unable to swim, drowns, while Clyde, unwilling to save her, swims to shore. The narrative implies that the blow was accidental, but the trail of circumstantial evidence left by the panicky and guilt-ridden Clyde points to murder. The local authorities are eager to convict Clyde, to the point of manufacturing additional evidence against him. And he repeatedly incriminates himself with his confused and contradictory testimony. Despite a vigorous, and untruthful, defense by two lawyers hired by his uncle, Clyde is convicted, sentenced to death, and after an appeal is denied, he is executed by electric chair. End of the summary. Thank you. Thank you.